Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome back to Lights Out Podcast. I am the MMA detective, Mike Davis, along with me, Miguel Iterate. And we've got the first champ champ ever. We got first UFC champ in this episode. Fight wise, we're going to talk about his uh, his his time in Pride, um, along with other other questions. But Mark Coleman, welcome, brother. Hey, thank you, Mike. Good to be here. All right, so Mark, we got to start hot. And at the UFC Hall of Fame, Kevin Randleman, obviously, you uh, gave his induction speech. You were there. And it's kind of an infamous night that John Jones ended up uh, having some issues with the law. What what was the feeling backstage with John? Oh, I could smell the alcohol in his breath. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, hey, I, hey, I, I John is um, my number one goat. Khabib's two. And then three and four, you know, I'm not sure George St. Pierre, but but Jones is my my number one goat. How to? But uh, no, he he's backstage, and I'm in my room, and he came in. We he's a big dude, man. Jesus, he wasn't the same guy. I, uh, I hugged him at UFC 100. I had to fight 100. He had to fight 100. But then I, he's a big dude. But I said we we talked about UFC 100, and I said. Uh, and I told him, I said, yeah, you remember I kind of threw you around that night, don't you? And he got very serious, man. He goes, he's like, no, I don't, I don't remember none, nothing like that. And I'm like, well, I said, well, well it, it was. And he's like, well, we're going to talk like this. He goes, I'm just not going to talk anymore. <laughs> and and I, I just changed the subject because uh, he was having a good night. But uh, it was he was very peaceful, very calm, happy. But I could, I could tell he had a couple. All right, you know, I'm pretty good at being able to tell people have a couple. You know, I had a couple a few times. But uh, um, yeah. well, what happened at UFC 100? Between well, you UFC two? 100, he um, he, I, I'm fighting Stephen Bonner. And uh, I passed him in the hallway. I didn't even really know him too much. I I probably did know him, but not much. But um, he come up and he was very uh, respectful to me, you know, giving me my respect. And then uh, he said, uh, he asked me if I wanted to roll around. And I said, well, my last roll was tonight, Wednesday night. I'm going to go, I'm going to go pretty hard tonight. I said, give me, you know, I'll be down there at seven. And then I, I didn't think he would show up, or I didn't even worry about it. I, I wasn't concerned about John Jones, but it, he did show up. And uh, I said, look, bro, I'm going to wrestle today. I ain't doing no motherfucking Muay Thai. You can do some jiu-jitsu, wrestle jiu-jitsu. I said, I ain't, I ain't getting cut. I ain't getting cut tonight, two days before my fight. And, uh, okay, no problem. And um, I literally smoked him. I smoked him, Mike. I took him down at least 10 times to one. And I'm not happy about that one he got on me. He got me with a, with a quick ankle pick. But uh, he got me with an ankle pick. I was, he surprised me. But I got right out. You know, I, I got right the fuck out. I was, I was bigger and stronger than this guy. I, was, I, was, I could have whooped him. UFC 100, I, I could have whooped Jones. I'm sure of it. I'm positive. Positive. But but there was at least 20, 20 people in the room, so I ain't making it up. I got 20 people, eyewitnesses, man. They all seen it. So, anyways, it's 10 to 1. He's getting real pissed, and he throws a spinning elbow, and it comes up like a quarter inch short of my lip. And I said, what the fuck are you doing? And I said, that's it, bro. I ain't having none of that shit. And uh, it, we, we had went about 15 minutes. And and 
my my warm up of my practice was over. I my confidence after whooping him like that, I knew I was whooping Bonner's ass because you know I respected Jones. Is it? I threw him around, and that's the end of story. Hey, I don't know what the hell he's thinking. It was embarrassing. So hey, I, I, let me jump in here uh, for context. John Jones at that time, UFC 100, he was fighting Jake O'Brien. I just want to ask, he's from that area, Mark. Are you, do you know O'Brien? Were you, was that a factor in UFC 100 that he was fighting your friend? No, Brian's no, in hell no. I don't care about friends. You know? I mean, I care about friends in that, but I, I, I might have known who Jake was, but I don't give a fuck. That's that's him versus John Jones. All right, cool. All right. So, I want to put this even to even more context. So you smoke John Jones on a takedown contest. When, what fight or how old were you when you first got taken down in MMA? Taken down? Did you ever get taken down in mixed martial arts? I think you did. Two in times. UFC. Two times. Oh, not in a, one time in the UFC. Two times in the UFC. Um, Shogun Hua. He snuck something in on me, man. Basically, it was complete fatigue, and I just kind of slipped on the cage. But Shogun Ua ended up on top of me um, in in Ireland, and I was ex. That's the only time I was on the bottom my whole career. I was on the bottom of him for about we'll say thirty seconds, which I could have got out in in two seconds, but I actually was very very comfortable laying there on my back because he couldn't even touch he couldn't hit me or nothing i just i took a little breather and then when i wanted out i got out okay then, so that was good yeah then fast forward to the my most probably my most disappointing fight in my career the randy couture fight uh and i it, 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 it's I had heard through the grapevine, Couture's got a game plan, and he always had a game plan. I was in on a lot of Couture's game plans, and he it was amazing how he followed his game plan to a T a lot of times. But uh, with me, I heard through the grapevine, um, he's going to take me down, and then I'm going to belly down immediately, and he's going to jump up and fucking choke the shit out of me quick. And the dude telling me this, I looked at him and said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean he's going to take me down? Nobody's taking me down. He ain't taking me down, first of all. But, huh, I started thinking, yeah, if I do hit the ground, I am going to belly down. But it's exactly what the fucker did. He took me down with an inside trip, and it's it. He took me down. I bellied down. He jumped up on my throat so quick that I didn't even – I was out within like a half a second. One second, I was like, I passed out. I mean, I didn't even, I didn't even have time to tap. So did I tap? No, but I really I didn't have time. Wow. So you've yeah. only been taken down two times in your entire fight career. Yeah. That's too, too many. <laughs> let me, Mark, let me jump in here. You mentioned Jones is, is your personal goat. Uh you know, you tangled a couple of times with my personal goat. So I wanted you to compare them, and that would be Fedor and Jones. Okay, well, hold on. That's that's just something. I, I my mistake. I'm going to put. I'm I, I'm going. It's hard for me to separate Fedor and Jones. So I, okay. I just forgot about my guy, man. I, I just I somehow I forgot about him real quick, but. No, he's right there. Fedor's right there. Yeah. Okay. That's good. All right. That's good. Cool. Okay. Cool. All right. So in Matt Hughes's book, he talks about a time where you're in Hawaii, where your guy Wes Sims, our guy Wes Sims, fuck is you. Fighting. I would have did something if I wanted to. Wait, wait, wait. Let me just set the question up. So Sims and uh, and and Tim Sylvia are going back and forth, and and Sims is just harassing the shit out of him, like he's all-star game type trolling in regards to Sylvia. And they, Sylvia broke Sims' arm on an arm bar. Sims refused to tap. And then there was a scuffle afterward where Hughes talks about going chest to chest with you and kind of setting the tone. 
Did he say chest to chest? Nah, I'm, I'm embellishing a little bit, but I'm trying to get a good sound bite. Listen, <laughs> it would have been chest to fucking balls. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen. Hey, I love Hughes, man. I love that fucker. And and, and he put me in an arm bar uh, one time in practice. To, before I re- beat Ricardo Marias in my comeback tour, uh, Hughes... He was at Militech, we're down there in Atlanta training, and uh, it was early in my camp, man, and and early in my camp, I'm fucking, yeah, it's horrible, but yeah, old Hughes and the, the Militech camp came in there, and hey, man, he, he just jumped into an arm bar, and I just, I wasn't ready for it, but Jesus Christ, did I hear about that from everybody. He went around bragging about that shit, but that's all right. He got it, um, but look, I jumped into the cage to to, to 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 help make sure nobody attacks Sims. That's what I'm there for, right? Right, for sure. At the at, at, at well, after the buzzer rings, but I jump in and it was Miller. It was uh, Hughes, probably Miller Tetch, and a third guy, and it was just me and West and Sims's dad. Sims's dad was in the corner. I think I could be wrong. Um. But I, I jumped in, and there wasn't no chest to chest. I offered a chest to chest, and uh, they kind of offered it back, but nobody took the step closer. So it just wasn't even – it wasn't no scuffle. It was It was nothing. It was a couple of dudes staring at each other. The fight was over. Sims lost, and fuck, that sucked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you depart the UFC. We talk about it in our first interview with you, and you head to Japan. What are the politics like? Like, before you even get there, you had to have conversations with uh, Saka Kibara. Even, I'm sure, Peretti may have called you. No, I mean, it was quick and easy, Mike. They, 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 they came to... I was on that three-fight losing streak. I'm training in San Clemente, California with um, Rick Bassman. I'm training. He's got a pro wrestling league, so I'm learning. I'm, I'm going to train some pro wrestling, but I told him, I said, look, bro, and the, the deal was, Jesus Christ, me and Kerr got to move into this. We're, we're, we're both poor at the time, but uh, we moved into this nice house in San Clemente. I got my kids at home. But I'm 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 desperate, man. I'm I'm out of a job. I'm out of a job, and so Saki Kabara, he he didn't come himself. He sent his people, Yukino and that uh, Yukino, whatever we call her, horse mouth. But uh, they came in and they said, "Oh, that's, Mr. Coleman, that's his uh, translator. Yukino's his uh, translator. Yeah, translator." But they came in and they they. I, I was really down, man, because I had no job, this and that. I'm doing some cheesy, cheesy pro wrestling shit. And, uh, fuck, I got bills to pay my kids, man. And, uh, well, they came into the office and sat me down and, oh, Mr. Coleman, we want you to fight Takata, son. And, uh, we will pay you $300,000. And I said, well, <laughs> what? I said, yeah. What's the catch? <laughs> you know, uh, and then they said, "Oh, but uh, you you must lose." <laughs> I said, "Oh, fuck." Well, I get it up front. Thousand, like to me, that was a million, baby, or two million. I said, "Fuck it." You know, they told me pro wrestling. They they kind of. They threw it at me as a pro wrestling gig, but I I knew what I was getting into. I'm not stupid, but I said okay, and uh, then they looked at me and they said, "Oh, three hundred thousand. That's yen. Three hundred thousand yen, Coleman. That's only thirty thousand dollars." So oh. I just said, "What the fuck, man? I ain't selling myself out for thirty. So we just walked away and shit, and then uh, we got him up to a number, 75. Why lie about it? I got 75K. So I took 75K with a promise to fight again. That's all that counted. 
with a promise to fight again another day, and uh, that's what mattered. That was it. But politics, uh, everything went smooth with me, kind of. Well, if you look at the if you look at the Takata fight, that's Pride Number Five, April 29th, nineteen ninety nine. It was almost as if he was having trouble putting himself in positions to actually get a submission. And like he did not know what he was doing. Well, you're talking about the ending. There was a couple times where no, it no, the, the ending was the only time it was supposed to be over. Is when it when it did end. That's the only time he was supposed to put me in a submission. Okay. But, how, how did you guys know the time? How what? How, we, did the referee tell you, or when did you know the time? But it's easy, man. It's like we're going first 10 minutes. 10 minutes, I'm going to beat him up, and then I'm going to get exhausted. The hammer is exhausted. He's been partying. <laughs> and I came to the corner, and I, I hadn't been training at all, but it, it, it's how crazy your mind really is, the difference between a, a – a real fight in a, in, a, in a pro wrestling match. I went ten minutes like lightning, man. I did. I wasn't even breathing. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and then I'm supposed to come to the corner and fucking. I'm supposed to be hanging over the ropes like I'm dead tired. But I was having so much fun, I forgot about that part. <laughs> and I'm just talking, and then all of a sudden I realized, oh shit! So. I sat down on my chair and I slumped over and I started acting tired. And then the the, the 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 second round was like at about three minutes in. He's gone. He called the fucking finish and it was the it was the stupidest finish ever, but I didn't have no power. I just said I I didn't have no say, but uh it was stupid. He I had to I had to feed him my leg. He couldn't even he couldn't even maneuver into it. So, yeah, it was, you know, it, it pretty much everybody knew for sure at that point. When they seen the finish, everybody knew. Yeah. So what you're saying is without the stress of knowing it's a real fight, your cardio was through the roof. Through the roof. I could have went forever that at that pace. That's crazy. Yep. That's wow. Well, speaking of like other crazy things that took place in Japan with you, um, Suzukawa was a Japanese pro wrestler that was doing like the gangster stuff. And you guys had a, a pro wrestling match, like an actual pro wrestling match, where the rumor was that his corner pulled a gun on you like during the match and that the fight, that the, the wrestling match became very real. Oh, no, you're way off. Okay. Way off, but it's it's a story that I don't let nothing bother me anymore. But this 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 person here, he got over on me good, and I was furious for a long, long time. I took an ass whooping. I didn't. I took kind of an ass whooping by this guy. It was a real fight. He turned it into a real fight. And there's nothing I can do about it. So it was a pro wrestling match that turned into a real fight. Yep. No Very gun scary, involved. Man. Was there any guns involved? No. The night before, at the introduction at, at, at Inoki's restaurant and bar, bar. The, yeah. the night before, okay, we got introduced, this and that. He came out smoking. I mean, he's a. it's like he's a hell of an actor for a pro wrestler, but he wasn't acting. He was really serious and... and, and, and he knew he was going to try to fucking whoop my ass from the get go. But so everybody went to their, their, their rooms to eat. I left the, the American room that we were eating and I went out to go to the bathroom. All of a sudden this son of a bitch runs up on me and he's chest to chest with me. And he's got three or four fucking people with him behind him. And I'm fucking in trouble. I mean, I'm 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 worried. I'm outnumbered here. And when are the knights going to come out? And uh, I just held my ground until the Americans came out of the locker room, or not the locker room, our food room. They got news of it, 
And then I had five. Then as soon as I got five back up, I called this motherfucker a fucking cunt. Told him I'll fucking kill him. And then he don't speak any English, but he had one American guy with him. And they, he said, you better shut up. You don't understand what they're saying to you right now. They're telling you they're going to slice you the fuck up. And I just said, I just showed no fear, man, because I didn't have any fear. As long as I got a little backup, I didn't have any fear, Mike. That ain't me. You know that. No. And, uh, I, and then finally, this goes on for about two, three minutes or two minutes, which is long enough. And then finally... Uh, the representative from Inoki's <coughs> from Inoki's wrestling he came and he got in the middle of it and he told this fucking guy he said get the hell out of here you're done you know that guy just that guy just ran off and took off and I looked at this promoter and said well what the fuck what the fuck is that shit you know and he said oh we're so sorry Mr. Coleman we will talk to the boss and we will figure this out. I said, look, you guys got him winning tomorrow. I said, fuck that. I should be winning tomorrow. I will talk to the boss. You might be right. And then the next day I show up at the arena. I'm in the locker room and uh, the promoters come up and they say, you were right, Coleman. Uh, because of this, we are punishing him and you the finish that you have, we're going to use that finish. I go, I got real scared. I'm not going to lie. I got a little bit nervous. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This dude ain't going to be okay with this. I think we're going to have some problems. Oh, we to be okay. We will have somebody out the ringside to help you, Coleman. I said, what the fuck? And then, so, so I get Tim in. Sylvia. I, Tim Sylvia is there. Who? Tim Sylvia. No. I seen him in the bar. I saw him in the video. Well, he he couldn't do nothing for me. Okay. Go ahead. No, Go ahead. It, it, it's it's we I walk out there by myself. I'm in the cage. And uh they introduced this fucker. And they I said, look at them fucking clowns that he was with last night. I said, them fucking clowns that he's with, I said, they're not gonna be there, right? Oh, no, Mr. Coleman, no, they're not allowed in the arena. Well, I get in the cage, I'm in the ring, it's on, and he comes in with three fucking long-haired, crazy fucking clowns, little skinny fuckers, though, you know what I mean? And and I'm nervous. I know what's going on, man. I know what's going on. The start of the match comes, he he, he comes over, and he was a sumo guy, but he, he didn't look like a sumo guy. He was an athletic sumo guy, right? muscles man you know what i mean and yeah and he ran across and he forearm face he forearm face chucked me about 10 times in a row and he fucking just lit me up woke me to wide up i grabbed onto him i desperately took him to the ground and i said okay i i was hoping that that was going to be the end he got it out of his system now we're going to finish this match it's only like it's five minute match so Let's go, let's go, let's go. So everything I had to do, I had, he's supposed to be helping me do the moves. I was having to do them because he was fighting everything, but I was able to take him down. I was trying to choke him out. Every time I get him in a, a submission hold, I would, I, the neck crank or whatever, uh, the ring was so small that all he had to do was scoot like one inch over and he could put his foot on the rope and I have to break. We stand back up every time. So... I literally took him down 10 fucking times and, 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 and I would get a two count, like a one, two, and then he would kick out or, or motherfucking, and it, it went on and Joe, I mean, this is the, I was in the worst of shape. We're at the 13 minute mark now. Right. And I am literally exhausted. He lumped my face up pretty good. In the first 20 seconds after that, I knew it was a real fight. He didn't hit me after that. But uh, no, no no, serious damage at all. Just maybe a little black eye. But uh, um, all I had to do, I keep calling you Joe. Joe Rogan. 
You look like Joe Rogan a little bit. Dude, dude, Mark, I get people at live events when I do my interviews calling me no Rogan. It's, <laughs> it's called no hey, Rogan. Anyways, anyways, um, all I had to do is punch this guy with a closed fist, and I would have got disqualified. So I was sticking by the, the, the pro wrestling rules. But all I had to do to get out of there was punch him, and I would have got DQ. Because his open palm strikes to my face, those are legal. So, 13 minute mark, it's one of the, it was, it's really one of the most disappointing moments of my life. It's way the fuck up there. Really? I said, that's it. I looked at the rep, I said, that's it. I'm fucking done. And I just walked out of the arena and it was like, I'm so pissed. Uh, all they had to do was punch him. But I quit. I, I fucking quit. And uh, that's the story nobody knows, man. But that's a loss on my record. <laughs> Is it a loss? No, it ain't no loss. It's a fucking draw. Thank you, Mark. I was a word. I was a word no, I mean, if, 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 there, if, you, if you couldn't. If he wasn't able to put his leg on the rope, I'd finish him 13 times. You know what I mean? I want to see this match so bad. I've never seen it. I want to I want to watch it so bad. It's going to make – oh, I can't remember much about it. Were you partying the night before? Oh, hell yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, not a hard party because you got to perform, but just, you know, yeah, I had some booze in me. Um, hey, Mark, let, let – I don't know if Mike has this on his list, but uh, I wanted to ask you about in Japan, they also took care of you in, in some ways. Like, for example, I, I'm sure you've talked about it, the, the banana uh, commercial where you dressed up as a banana. And I think you did like a shaving commercial with Vanderlei Silva, like your rival. But like you guys are shooting commercials together. Why don't you talk about that aspect of being over there? Oh, that was the coolest, man. Being over, being able to go to Japan and not have uh, have to fight or 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 pro wrestle or anything. It was just so relaxed, so calm. I got I got to take my uh, parents on a free trip to Japan, and uh, me and Wanda, me and the Shootbox team, we were always always really good. It was one night. It was only one night that the Shooter Box and Hammer House had an issue with each other, and then. Uh, we we quickly we quickly resolved that problem, but uh, the, the 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 banana commercial I got a, I took a lot of shit from all the Americans because it was the it was the fruit cakeest costume you ever see, and the whole commercial banana. was just so fruit cake, man. I had to I was the king of banana land, man. Eat these bananas, <laughs> you know that was but whatever they said, Colby, you sold out. I said, yeah, fucking. My dad was so pissed. Because he's seen all these fans, he's seen a post in the banana commercial and everybody ripping on the hammer. My daddy was so pissed. He said, "Blah blah blah, you guys would have did it too for a million dollars." I said, "No, man, twenty five thousand, you know." But I said, "Dad, man, Dad, please don't read that shit. Who gives a fuck? Is this some little kid?" And they're right. I wore a fruitcake costume. <laughs> It's phenomenal. Just the, uh, I just love food. I love quality food, and uh, man, they 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 just they they didn't want to pay you more for a fight, but they they spend as much money as you can eat on you. But then, uh, yeah, the shirk the shit razor commercial that was like a famous commercial. They did that commercial every year with like different athletes, and. Uh, I was just in the right place at the right time to, to nail that, but that was cool. But the, the, the one thing in Japan was one, I don't even want to go into it, man. I had to do a game show over there that they, I had to take, uh, I had to take these Velcro patches off the guy's ass in a wrestling match. I had to get them off three guys' ass. And, and the last guy I had to take his shorts off to, to retain the belt. And, uh, man, that was, I was exhausted taking these pants off this guy, man. He was so much tougher than I anticipated. <laughs> I got him with twenty. I got him off with twenty seconds left. It was like my night was going to be ruined because the the promoters told me 
Coleman, we cannot afford to pay the $20,000 prize money, so you must get these pants off. And I'm like, they're allowed to hold on to them. They, they made a new rule. They had done the show about eight times, and the, the, the athletes all eight times got the pants off so easy because the contestants weren't allowed to hold on to their pants, right? But then when I came, they changed the rules, and these guys were allowed to hold on to their pants, and it was literally fucking war, man. It was on. I had to, <laughs> I had to squish them a little bit. But I got them all for 20 seconds left, and uh, I was so damn happy, man. It was like I just won a fucking UFC fight, you know? Another dude's pants in your hand. <laughs> well, I, I, I took them down, this and that. I'm, I'm pulling these pants down, and and I just fucking ripped them right off. And they, they, they said, ripping them off don't count. You got to pull them off the bottom of the feet. Intact. Oh. So it was hard. It was fucking hard. All right. So you make your pride debut. Everybody's got hippo eyes looking at it. You know, everyone's scratching their head when you fought Takata. They put you into uh, pride number eight, November 21st, 1999. You got a six foot eight giant in Ricardo Marias. On a, on a four fight losing streak. On a four fight losing streak. Yep. Yeah, Marias yeah. is one of Henzo's uh, top students. I shouldn't say top students. It's one of his prized students, and he is an abs. He looks like a barbarian. Yeah, he, he he was pretty intimidating. But going into the fight, I had hooked up with Obaki out there uh, from Atlanta. You know Obaki? Do you know Obaki? Of course. Uh, Tim uh, was it? Cal- Tim Tim Catalfo. Catalfo, um, yeah. Brandon Hinkle had moved down there, and uh, Hinkle just called me up and said, uh, come on down. It was the super facility, man. I mean, he, him and Bill Goldberg went into business, opening up the first. It was a super facility, like, you know, $4 million building with, like, fucking 10 rooms, dude. It was huge. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous, but there was nobody in there. Nobody going in there. It went. It went bankrupt, obviously. But where was it at? Down and, uh, Georgia, where was it located? I really like the shit that Obaki taught, man. I was really able to make it work, and uh, I went into that fight pretty confident, not overly confident for sure, because my my cardio wasn't there yet. But uh, um, I'm on a four fight losing streak, so mentally I'm having doubts. But uh, ah, fuck, man, I just put it on to do, man. Hey. He's one of those black belts that does he really deserve a black belt? I mean, he really would never put me in a, a bit of danger the whole time. So, Obaki, Tim Catalfo, where was this gym located? Atlanta. And they just couldn't get the people through the doors, huh? This is way back when it was too early for a gym like this, man. It was beautiful. You ever been to Couture, Extreme Couture? I, I stepped foot in there, yeah, once. It's bigger than that. Jesus. Yeah, so it, it just wasn't time. Bill Goldberg and Obaki are good friends. Goldberg forked over 500000 or whatever to get it going. And uh, now, nah, man, Obaki had a nice little party with it. The Obaki, Obaki was a guy who was on my list to ask you about here during this interview. What, uh, you, you mentioned that the stuff he taught was work for you. What, what was it? I remember Obaki. He was kind of like a stocky, but, you know, wrestler, muscular guy. What was he teaching you? Like, why did he teach you? Like, you know what I mean? I thought you'd be above him. No, man. You got you don't get it. He's a, he's a college-level, very, very, very good wrestler. And he learned all he learned all kinds of the, the can opener base, the can opener, the cervical chokes, uh, all that shit. I, I, I fucking... I controlled Ricardo Marias with the can opener for probably 10 out of 20 minutes. I was cranking on his neck, breaking his fucking neck. I almost got him to tap. Why does he work with me? Because it takes a big, strong man to make this shit work. And Mm -hmm. I damn near, I damn near fucking tap Marias with it. I had him so, I had him gurgling so many times, but, he was just literally, when it came to life and death for him, 
he just fucking explode one last time and he was able to to get out of it. Wow. So but, Obaki. So yeah, Obaki ended up being in my corner um for the for the first round. And and Hinkle was there, and so was Randleman. Yeah, for the first round, but then uh, I didn't take Oba. I didn't take Obaki back with me in the final round. I'm, I wasn't one to. I appreciate Obaki, but you know what? No, he just showed me a couple things. He didn't. He didn't show me the the fucking game. He, I if you know, I used it that night, but I tell you what, I didn't really use it in the grand in, in the finals. I didn't use his stuff too much at all. Well, here, let's get let's get there. So. You beat Ricardo Marias. That's November 21st. Um, January 30, 2000 is the opening round for the Grand Prix. You got Masaki Sataki. He's a K1 star. going to be a problem. By that time, I, I forgot about the four losses. I got about six months of training under my belt now. And Masaki Sataki is a fucking dead man. That's it. He's going down. So, well, my cup coming back. Well, did, did you see where Masaki trained for this fight? Yeah, with uh, Mo Smith. Why were those hit? It seemed like Maurice Smith and Frank Shamrock really went out of their way to target you in regards to, like, training anybody that you had fought. Well, I tell you what, uh, as simple as this, um, no, Japan called them up and asked them if they'd do it. Oh. Pride, Pride wanted him to be ready for me a little bit. Yeah, he met the so, can opener after all, though. What? It looks like you got him with a can opener while we're on that subject. I could have got him a hundred times, man. I could have got him a hundred times with that can opener that night. We could have started over 20 times. I would have tapped him every time. If, if you guys watch the fight, his reaction to your strength, it changed his life. Like it was, it was one of those things where he felt it. He's like, wait a minute. This is, this is something serious. And it, it was, uh, he got frightened for sure. That, after feeling that, it, not before, but after. That's what happens uh, in a lot of fights. That, that, that's when you get that initial touch with your opponent, that's what you're, that's what I'm looking for is, how fucking strong is this guy? That's that's what I want to know. And uh, nobody's ever changed my life, but uh, yeah, I definitely, I def, I definitely changed some people's lives. They're like like Stephen Bonner. I mean, he said he just couldn't fucking believe it. Big John McCarthy. I let that fucker lock up a triangle choke on me. I told him we're we're arguing upstairs. I said somehow the triangle choke came up, and uh, I said it ain't it ain't it don't work. Yeah, it don't work. He said, Coleman. I said, I'll let you lock it up. He said, Coleman. I said, well, I'll be down there tonight. And Big John came down there. He came down there. He walked in. He locked up the triangle choke two or three times. And every fucking time I came out. Nothing. You mean Gracie Black Belt, Big John McCarthy? What'd you call him? He's a Gracie Black Belt. Yeah, he fucking... I let that fucker lock it up. Huh. Nothing. Well, you changed camps after that. You go with Pat Militich. What was the reason for uh, you going? Not, not right away, bro. I, I had, I had, I had at least three, maybe four months until the second round. And then I, I went, I went after Sataki. I, I trained it in Columbus, Mark Coleman Hammer House, bro. It was me. Me, me, me. And then I was so fucking ready about a month before. The, I was I was never ready. I never declared myself ready for a fight until the fucking time. But the Grand Prix, I declared myself ready a month out. And then I was so comfortable. But then I had to get away from the wife and the kids and everybody. So then I just called Militech up. I just wanted to go down there and hang out. But don't get me wrong. Um, it worked out great. The first practice, uh, he put it to me. Uh, he, he put me through about an hour of, uh, of grappling with his boys. 
And then he put me through another half hour of his, his Miltech cardio in the back. And I looked at him after both. I looked at him and said, well, what's up? You know, it's like eight, nine o'clock at night, you know, 10 o'clock at night. And he's like, well, you want to go run the hill? I said, I don't give a fuck. And we went run, we went and ran the, we went and ran the famous Miltech Hill. And here's where he fucked up. I said, how many? And he said, 10. That's where he fucked up. He should have said, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. That's that's what I do as a coach. Because he gave me 10, and I went and fucking busted them 10 out like nothing. And I looked at him and said, anything else, coach? You know? And then, and then the next day, uh, the second day, I went. He said, "We're gonna be sparring tomorrow," and I got all nervous. You know what I mean? Sparring makes me nervous, especially with fresh blood. But uh, yeah, I went in there and um, he put me up against one of his guys, and uh, we're we're just flowing. We're not flowing. It's on. I don't flow. When I spar, I fucking I hit hard. You can hit me hard. I'm gonna hit you hard. That's the way it goes. But uh, so I'm going with this guy and. I fucking jab out there, and then he, and then I threw a, a left hook right after it, and it just plowed him on the temple pretty much, set him into the set him into the wall. He got up. He wasn't totally KO'd, but he got up and said, "Pat, I'm done," you know. And then they had a pro boxer in there. He was a 180 pound pro boxer, and he came in there. He went around with me. And I'm not going to lie, he was a much better boxer, more speed, this and that, but he couldn't hurt a mosquito. You know what I mean? And 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 I fucked, I mean, I was getting closer and closer to really putting the hurt on him. He, after the first round, he said, I got to go. He left after one round, and Miltech didn't have anybody left. Some bitch put the gloves on, and me and Miltech went three rounds of fucking fire, bro. We went three rounds and it was awesome. And uh, you can ask literally Pat's whole left side of his arm, whole left side of his arm body went numb. By the end, of, by the end of the third round, he was fighting me with one hand, and it, it, I broke his nose. He said, and 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 his, his left arm was numb, but he kept going. And then the buzzer rang. I'm exhausted. I'm really exhausted. It was awesome. That motherfucker is the tough. He's about as tough as they get, man. He's as tough as they get. And we just had a great fucking three three week camp. We hit it off perfectly. He figured out what I could couldn't do very fast. And he's a genius, you know, man. He, he's a genius. And having him in the corner, I didn't even realize how much it helped. But I went back and. I went back and watched the fight, and it's so quiet in there that you can actually hear the corner man. And he's just talking to me. He's talking to me in a regular voice that I'm talking right now. <laughs> he's talking to do it, do it, uppercut, uppercut. You know, just real calm and cool. I didn't even realize I went back and watched the fight. And a lot of times he calls something out, and I just do it and just work to a perfection. You know. Now did you ever get taken down there at the camp by Steve Rusk or Matt Hughes? Or well, Steve Rusk is the guy. Steve Rusk is the guy that I left hooked and sent him home. Okay. Steve so Rusk, no take down by Rusk. Home, but no, I've heard this before. Nobody took me down. Okay. I might have got submitted a few times. I don't know. But no, no, I do not give up takedowns. I'm an Olympic motherfucking wrestler. Steve Husk ain't ever taking me down. And little ass Matt Hughes ain't fucking ever taking me down. Let's get that straight. That's a fucking lie. <laughs> so when Pat Militich said it, you can hear him laughing as it comes out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it is an absolute shot to get you yelling. Absolutely. <laughs> what? I think he did it just to plus pause. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, I got you because it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you roll into a cure. And if you ask John Jones, he'll tell you I never took him down. Come on. 
He will. He's a fucking. He, he did not like me saying I, I whooped his ass that night. He said, "No, I don't remember nothing like that." He he would never admit that I beat him. He's narcissistic, man. Yeah, yeah. So your for your opening round in the Pride Grand Prix. Well, first up, what was the feeling backstage walking into it? I mean, it's you had like eighty thousand people there. Look, it's it's the. It's as cool as it gets. I got I got the pleasure a bunch of times. The Pride Grand Prix just magnified it. But I was dealing with the problem of having to fight behind Royce Gracie, man. Fucking hour long. I'm fighting next. So it was completely different than any any other time ever. So the feeling was, when in the fuck am I going to get to walk? An hour later, I had to warm up how many times. It was very frustrating. Miltech had to keep me calm. But ain't nothing you can do. In hindsight, that's the way it is. That's what I signed up for. And it, it, whatever. I, I, it, it was because I knew I had a Kira Soji and I had a game plan that I never had. I only had it one other time, and that was against Dan Severn. UFC uh, 12 against Dan Severn was the only time that I planned out and I planned out going out and trying to knock the fucking guy out. And Severn, I just thought I could do it. And I did. First punch fucked him up. First punch hit him right on the nose, and he had to shoot on me. That's a dumb move. But then the second, the only time I ever looked to punch anybody was Severn, and then fast forward to Akira Soji, and uh, I had gone with Militech, and Militech gave me the confidence. He said, Coleman, your fucking stand-up is pretty fucking amazing. Okay. Not amazing, pretty good. Okay, let me tell you. If you guys, everybody knows Mark Coleman, ground and pound, headbutts, grinder. You watch that Shoji fight, bro. Your hands were legit. Well, I came out there and uh, first punch I threw was a fucking quick fucking jab right in his fucking lips. And he looked at me and said, oh, it was like he, he said, I didn't know you could punch. And uh, that was so fun, man. So fun. Uh, yeah. I, I Hey, listen, I'm telling you, Mike, I just didn't think. I knew how long it took me to become a great wrestler. So I, I thought like, well, I can never become a great boxer because I don't have enough time. If I would have known that I could have got great in two or three years, I probably would have went that route. And if I would have went that route, uh, I'm, I'm probably, uh, I'm knocking motherfuckers out. I'm knocking them out, period. Everybody else did it. Why couldn't I do it? Daniel Cormier turned himself into an incredible stand-up fighter. Stipe was a wrestler. All these guys transformed into Dan. I could have been Dan Hendo bomb. My Hendo bomb would have been bigger than his bomb. I tell you that. But I didn't do it. Hey, no excuse. I'm just saying I wish I would have. But I didn't do it because I didn't think I had time to get great at it. So I'm going to use what I'm great at. It's, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of smart. Koscheck, Matt Hughes, both of them fell in love with their stand-up. Uh, Justin Gaethje, another guy in love with his yeah, stand-up. Yeah, all of them, man, all of them. You got the natural power, too. It would have been a good fit. Let me ask you, you said you took, you know, you trained in Columbus and then spent a hard three weeks with Militage. Was that part of that, uh, like, separating from Kerr in the Arizona scene? Because you were going to fight Kerr possibly in this in this tournament? No, that had nothing to do with it. Kerr was in Arizona. I'm in I'm in Ohio, but but uh, Kerr, man, I hate saying this, but Kerr gave me a call about you know three months out when he found out I'm on the same bracket. Yeah, he gave me a call, man. He was uh, he was very concerned. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Well, so they let you guys know three months out. So it wasn't you show up there and then they, that was actually my next question. How did you find out the tournament, like where you were in the tournament? Well, that's what we was waiting on it. Then one day they disclosed it and, and um, sounded about right to me. It sounded the matchup was – just the way I can see them doing it because they don't they don't want me and Kerr on opposite brackets because they know they're gonna have that in the finals. They don't want that. They want they gotta give they gotta give Igor a chance or Sakuraba a chance. So so they split us up and I liked it. 
I loved it, man, because I was, I, you know, I love the big stage, man. And ain't nothing bigger than me and Kurt in the semifinals. That's the fight of the night right there. That's the fight everybody would want to see, period. That should be in the finals. And uh, I'm going to get him. You know, I'm going to find a way to get him. He's a bad son of a bitch. But, man, hey, I told you, he called me six months out. And uh, he had some suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> so your attitude going into this event you know mark you you can sometimes be an angry dude it, it 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 appears occasionally when you fight i've never seen you this red hot shoji you took shoji down he claims he got a low blow and you almost ripped the referee's head off well i, I just uh, i got a I got a big growl, but I don't really ever bite. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, yeah was... fuck you. you. I just wasn't, I wasn't going to, that's why I wasn't very welcome with USA Wrestling. You know, a lot of organizations, they didn't like me because I ain't kissing ass once the fight starts. You're trying to fuck me here. It wasn't in the nuts. Fuck you. And that's it. I mean, of course, yes, I can get angry, but in the middle of a fight, I can get real angry. Yeah, so, Mark, just Mark, so everybody I knows. Of, I just, okay. I just want to say, Mike. I'm sorry, Mike. I think a lot of that carried over, like when you were a corner man. You know, you took over the corner. You know what I mean? Bro. It's like, it's like you were good, and you felt even in this interview, you talked about how you felt it was your job to guard your guys. So you were always in that character. Um, and it worked for you. You know what I mean? It's like talk about that because you you you're the A guy. You're the A guy wherever you go, and, I, and that you, it suits you well. Well, I I tried to. I wanted to be. I wanted to be scared. I wanted people to be scared of me. I wanted to intimidate people. I wanted our team to intimidate people because I knew how I felt about a team like Shootabox. Everybody was scared of them. I wanted everybody to be scared of us, and 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 you know maybe eh, and, and there was a lot of acting going on, man. Come on, I'm crazy, but I knew when the cameras were on, and sometimes I I overdid it for the cameras, acting. But it was me. But now when I'm in the corner, unfortunately, I'd be honest with you, I was drunk 98 percent of the time, and. Mark Coleman drunk in a corner. It's a very disrespectful person. I don't like that person, but I did it and I got away with it. I should have been, I should have been handcuffed a few times. But in our boys in the cage, that is my I want them to win so freaking bad. I want them to win better than they want to win, man. I'm screaming. I got the loudest, baddest voice in the motherfucking world, I think. Yeah, I, I can vouch for that. I'm gonna <laughs> let my boy, like, like I'm gonna let my boys know I'm fucking there, and let's go. Don't quit. Quitting is the only thing you can't. You can't get it back. You fucking quit. It's with you for life. Just yeah, keep no, fighting. We... A lot, a lot of people laugh at me. My dudes are on the bottom sometimes, getting their ass whooped, and I'm saying you're doing great. Keep fucking fighting. And then people say. Cole is the dumbest corner man in the world. You know, why is he telling somebody they're doing great? You dumb fucker. Cause you yeah, know, I, I remember one time at the IVC that you uh, took over the corners. Like the Americans were having a bad day. Like Serrano took a loss. Like Godsey took a loss, ugly losses. And you were like, we, you were not having it. You like, you took over the rest of the corners and you were, you know, getting people pumped up, and you're the only American voice in that place screaming. You know, everybody, even veteran fighters were kind of like, they're like surrounded by 3,000 Brazilians, and you just didn't give a F, you know what I mean? It was 
Unbelievable. That's what I mean about the classic type A personality. It was awesome. Well, somebody's got to come first. You know what I mean? So there's 5,000 of them, but one of them motherfuckers got to come first. And if I'm loud enough, if I'm the big lion and my roar is loud enough, I can win the fight without anybody even coming forward. And that happened 95% of my life. I, I would rather win the fight let the man know I'm going to fucking hurt him. And then just hopefully he swallows his pride. It'd be a horrible thing. It's something that I would never do. I want a man to swallow his pride and just beat it. And that's, that, that's, that's the ultimate win there. UFC two veteran Fred Edish here. And you're listening to the lights out podcast. <laughs> Winning a war without firing a shot. Absolutely. Yeah. I was good at it, man. I, I didn't get in many fights. I, 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 you know, maybe 15. And I don't consider that very many at all. Um, and, and 14 of them were fucking one punch. You know, it's over type deal. So I really didn't get in many fights because I got in a hundred or a thousand of them where I had to yell like this only twice as loud and let the dude know I'm going to snap your fucking neck in half like a chicken bone. You better get, you know, I was better than that. I'm not on right now, but. I would scare somebody. I literally, and then there'd be three, three of his buddies would be standing around. I would say, and listen, motherfuckers, when I get this fucker on the ground and I'm fucking smashing him, if any of you fuckers step in, I'm going to kill you. So it was just a done deal, man. Well, yeah, no, I just so everybody understands. One, one yeah. second. Oh, just so everybody God. understands, like, Shoji, his record was 6 3 and 5, but it was a Japan 6 3 and 5. He had wins over. Uh, Wally Ishmael, Ebenezer Braga, and Guy Mesger. So that was a legit first round opponent. Yeah, it's, nobody knows that, but he, Soji, he never got finished. He never had no. been finished. And, 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 fuck, man, I couldn't finish him. More time he I could have. everything. He went the to the side. hospital for a week. But, Mark, I was told, I, I heard a rumor that Soji's on his way out to your fight. Uh, deliberately, like, you know, threw up on himself, like put his fingers down his throat, drew up on himself and came in like covered in shit. Like, you know, is, is that true? Do you, do you think that happened or is that a rumor? I guess it's possible, but uh, I, I you ain't got time to deal with a little puke, man. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. I, I, I probably, that, that's something that I probably would have noticed, though. Yeah, okay. He, uh, he he was in between rounds. Was it looked like he threw blood up from the damage that he was taking? It's it's a savage beating, man. And he he wasn't going away. And your cardio was like next level. Like he yeah, ran into level. after. If you go watch the 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 when they announced the winner, he 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 was hopeful. If it's a draw after fifteen, if it's a draw, you're gonna go five more minutes. He was so hopeful that it was going to be a draw for him to get five more minutes. And yeah, he's the ultimate punching bag. He is. I come to Pat Militech. This is how bad. When I got fucking robbed against the Pedro Hizzo fight, my mind was, your mind's never the same after that. It's a fight that I clearly thought I had won, and I was in shock. Well, Soji fights the first decision. Well, no, no. Well, Ricardo Mariah, I got that one, but I kind of knew that one. But uh, Soji, I was so fucked up that I came over to the corner. And I said, hey, Pat. I said, Pat, did I win? And he kind of laughed. You know what I mean? I said, no, man. We're in Japan. <laughs> but no, I got it. Yeah, I. it's a fantastic fight. Highly recommend people watch that. Um, now... Fujita is in the second round. He's your second round opponent. How much time in between? Obviously, you watched his fight against Mark Kerr, his opening round. Um, what were your thoughts in the in the in the locker room watching him and Kerr fight? Oh, that was the fight. I was that that was the most exciting fight for me ever, other than my own. You know, uh, I'm sitting back there and um, I got the winner, man. And uh, I Fuji's a very new fighter, but. I could tell he was a, I knew before I seen him, I heard about him and he, I did see him fight. I knew he had wrestling background. I, I seen the size of his head. I knew he was going to be tough as hell, but 
I, I just wanted him to last. I wanted him to last about five, 10 minutes with Kerr just to get Kerr a little tired for me. And uh, Kerr violently, violently wrecked him for five minutes. He hit him with some of the hardest knees I've ever seen. Somehow this giant headed Japanese guy took it. And I'm in the back room just saying, come on, hold on, hold on. And then all of a sudden I see Kerr fucking fold up. He got taken down. Fujita took him down. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I, I knew. I knew Kerr, Kerr hadn't been. Kerr, Kerr was fucking training great until a month before the fight. He was training with Boss Rudin. He had a great training camp going. And his fucking girlfriend made him come home to uh, Arizona. And Boss was saying, well, why? Watch the smashing machine. What are, you, what are you going to do? He's like, I'll figure it out, Boss. Well, he didn't figure it out. He didn't train. And and five minutes in, uh, he, he said he had a sugar crush, whatever you want to call that. You know, sugar, he's got sugar issues. But uh, I think he got a fatigue crush, man. And he just sat there and got beat on for the last 10. I was sitting backstage saying, Fujita's dead. I mean, this is he's done. This is perfect. I had zero fear. He was dead, man. I got him. And then, and then, and, and, and I watched both. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's it. And then, so then we're sitting in the locker room. We got an hour or so in between. You know what I mean? And I'm sitting beside Big Daddy Goodrich, who gave Bo Chanson a good eight minute fight. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm sitting beside Big Daddy and uh, showing him my fist. I against Soji, I fucked my knuckle up. It was all swelled up, man. It was all swelled up. It was hurt pretty good, but uh, I wasn't worried about it. But I'm showing Big Daddy. And then the Japanese come in and say, Oh, Mr. Coleman. Uh, Fujita is maybe maybe not going to fight. You're going to fight Big Daddy second round. I'm sitting right beside him. Now that's politics. Well, here, so Fujita's hurt, but wasn't Guy Metzger? Wasn't he the alternate to be in the tournament? Wanderlei Sell was supposedly was supposed to be the alternate, and Guy Metzger. Wanderlei Silva, yes. So, so what? Why? Did they pass on them or, or was <clears throat> they blew it? They blew it. They 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 made for G to get in there to get his third prize money. They blew it. <sighs> yeah, it could have been Silva. That'd have been epic. Yeah. Yeah. I smashed them. Yeah, it was He's too small for me. So Brian Johnston threw in the towel for Fujita uh, as the opening bell sounded. Yeah, um, two seconds. That might be the fastest stoppage in Pride. <laughs> two seconds has got to be the fastest stoppage ever, doesn't it? I think so. <laughs> How can it be faster? It. <laughs> How can it be it. faster than two seconds? Right, right, right. I mean, he threw in the towel right when the right when the bell rang. He threw in the towel, so they rang the bell right after they rang it. They rang it again. You know, that's it. I don't see how you can win a fight faster than that. Um, that that he, he he was scared of my growl. Was Fujita training with Johnston, or was it was this a relationship that they had backstage? Oh, no. I, they got into pro wrestling together. They were doing pro wrestling together. Okay. Johnson was Johnson was was becoming a pretty big time pro wrestler over there. Yeah, I always liked him. I always liked him. Um. Igor Bochenshin, you meet him in the finals. He stops Gary Goodrich at 10-14. Um, corner stoppage against Sakuraba. And um, you meet him in the finals. What are your thoughts walking to the ring? Well, that's how that's what I had planned the night before. It's going to be uh, Soji, Kerr, and then uh, Igor. That, that was my game plan. And then originally, uh, the night before, it was a 20-minute time limit in the finals. So my game plan was going to be I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ground and pound him hard. I wanted to – I didn't just want to cruise. I wanted to, I wanted to smash his eyes for 20 minutes and uh, get the win. Well, the night before in the rules meeting, 
first they said no knees to the head on a on a ground opponent unless he's on his back, which is crazy. How are you gonna get somebody stuck on their back? You know what I mean? It, it's it's impossible. And that that shook me up because that was what I was one of my go tos. And then they said it's gonna be a no time limit finals, and I just I just fucking almost pissed my pants. That shook me up pretty good because I I just I knew I could go for a long long time, but. I seen Igor go for over an hour a few times. You know what I mean? And 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 I just I didn't know I I did visualize possibly finishing him. And believe it or not, um, shit. What was that? I what's that called? The damn that that basic arm crank. I'm on top of him. I put him in a. I, I, Mike, you're a mute. Huh? A key lock or Kimura? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put him in a key lock, but I had I had thought about that leading up to the fight that I might be able to get this guy in that. And I got him in it. And uh, it, if I would have been listening to Militech, I probably would have finished him with that, which would have been – it would have been cool, but I wouldn't have jumped off the ropes. You know what I mean? If I would have got him in a key lock, it would have been okay. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, but I, I – I, I didn't have it. I didn't have it perfected. I mean, I, I didn't know how to finish it, and I was letting him get his arm way too high. All I had to do was pull his arm down to his side, and I would have snapped his arm. But uh, I just didn't do that, man. So when he got out of that, I kind of said to myself, like, "Damn, damn, damn, damn! That was my chance. I don't know. I don't know what how to finish him now." And uh, well, hell, man. I mean. It was, it, you know, a miracle, man. I got him stuck in a corner, and I still sometimes don't see why he didn't just neat belly down. But I answer, I asked that question to, to people on, on social media. I said, why didn't Igor just belly down? And somebody gave me the perfect answer. They said, well, Coleman, when you're getting kneed in a fucking head, you ain't thinking straight. <laughs> and it's right. Yeah. True. All he had to do was belly down, and I'd still be in there fighting that fucker. <laughs> well, you win. It's, um, it's interesting when um, there was an article. I think it was in Bleacher Report, and they had talked about the greatest sporting trophies like in existence, and that pride belt is either number one or number two. Yeah, the one that you won that night. Oh yeah, it's fucking beautiful, man. It. I got. Three belts that are beautiful. UFC 10 was in a, like a, a very, very unique UFC belt. No, None like it. It's it's beautiful. And then um, UFC 12 is pretty nice. But the, the first championship belt is there's, – there's other ones that look just like it too. But then the Pride belt, of course, Pride was going to come out with the prettiest belt ever. And the last guy they wanted to have it was me. Yeah, I think that I, was going to be around I, Kerr's waist I, for sure. Well, Kerr or Bochanchi. Bochanchi had knocked him out three months or six months earlier. Yeah. I bet yeah. you I bet you the Japanese had dreams of Sakuraba walking away with that, too. Don't forget. Oh, dreams, but, you know, not happening. Too small. Mm -hmm. yeah. Too small. But. Yeah. Didn't they offer you Ken Shamrock after that? No. Wasn't that one of the names being thrown around? Oh, to fight him? Yes. No. What happened? Right after I won the, right after I won that bitch, I go home, and uh, my manager at the time's idea of negotiating was, let's do nothing, because they offered, they offered the same amount of money to me as I got before I became champion. They offered me the same amount of money, I, you know, well fuck no, of course, but. My manager just said, let's just wait. Let's just wait. Let's just wait. And that's what happened. You got to get back in there, Mike. When you're, when you're, when the oven's hot, you got to get back in there. And, and I sat on the shelf for eight months negotiating and nothing was happening. They just weren't coming up and nothing was happening. And then finally they called and asked me if I could pro wrestle. And I said, well, yeah, probably. You know what I mean? Don't sound too hard. And I got twenty five thousand to do a main event pro wrestling match, like a like a month later, and then that's when Pride seen that 
I had some charisma. I had some character to me. I have some champion that because champion's got to look like a champion. You know what I mean? So sure. Shamrock, was, Shamrock wasn't being thrown around at all. His name, I, it, maybe vaguely. I would have never said no if that's what you're getting at. So if they, I would have said hell yes. All right. When you trained with Ken Shamrock, did he ever get a takedown? Never. Did he knock you out? No, he didn't even touch me hard. Did he knock you down? No. Okay, so the people over on MixedMartialArts.com, the underground forum, they claim, one person claims, that Ken shut the gym down, knocked you out, you shook his hand. Uh, I, I think a, another fighter, oh, his name, said that Ken got a takedown. I don't think Ken has got the wrestling ability to do that with you, but anything can happen in a practice. Nobody's got the ability. Ken Jammer don't have the ability. Nobody does. Maybe one guy over in Russia. What the fuck? Ken Jammer, he wouldn't even wrestle me. He wouldn't, he wouldn't wrestle me. He wouldn't go on the ground with me. He was scared. And then, and then we showed up there. Like on a Thursday night, we had we practiced from seven to nine, and he was showing me some ground and pound shit, making us ground and pound each other. Me and my teammates making us ground and pound each other. It was crazy. Mikey Burnett was there. He was a badass man, just sitting there. You weren't even allowed to escape. You just had to sit there and protect yourself. <laughs> my poor guys. You know, I was fine with it because, but nobody got hurt. But uh, then all of a sudden, day two fucker comes walking in with his his Muay Thai class and then live round. Let's go, Coleman. All right. We went about three, three or four rounds and the three or four rounds, I would say they were two they were two very average boxers going at it. Very strong average boxers going at it, but nobody up until this point, it was really close and nobody hit each other hard, but then fourth round I decided I'm going to pull the trigger on a one, two, three. And I one, two, three, that fucker. And he didn't go down. And I was like, because it was at the end of the fourth round. I heard him say 20 seconds. I said, fuck it. Here we go. Boom, boom, boom. He didn't go down. The buzzer rang. And I walked off and uh, I'm thinking, damn, I don't hit very hard. I thought maybe, maybe I don't hit very hard. And then uh, fifth round started and his fucking coach the fifth round, I was ready to go round five, baby. Let's see what we got. His coach said, we're going to do a Muay Thai drill round. I'm like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? So punch, punch, kick, punch, punch, kick, you know. And, and fucking Shamrock, he couldn't do the basic, simplest drill. He was fucking it up. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm talking him through the drill. This ain't my territory. Let's go, kid. Kick, kick, punch. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Then about three minutes into that round, he stops and he says, Did you fucking hit me? And I said, I said, Yeah, I fucking smashed you about four minutes ago. He goes, What the fuck? He goes, I don't remember any of it. And he was just on Queer Street. If the, the fifth round would have started live, I fished him. It's, it's no doubt he wasn't even there. He was on Queer Street. So that's the truth. Nobody else, everybody else is a fucking liar. Come say it to my face, you fucking cunts. You You're fucking cunts. Girl. I don't I don't have to make up my stories, Mike. My stories are good enough that I don't have to lie. So anybody on the underground forum watching this, that is a, a direct go say it to Mark's face. Thank you, Mark. That's settled. Not my face. Mark space. <laughs> hey, I, I, I got a, a thread there I want to follow, too. You, you mentioned that uh, negotiating after the Grand Prix was tough, that you had a, a, a layoff, and that you took that pro wrestling gig. That was maybe your first time doing the pro wrestling thing. You you also went over and you did a pro wrestling tag team match with, like, uh, Random, and didn't you one time? Was it, was, did you get uh, to My the first match was with Mark Kerr, tag team. We were the dream team. My first match ever was me and Kerr, Dream Team, and uh, it, it, it was awesome. 
uh, Kerr kind of didn't understand wrestling too much because he overvalued how good it is to sell getting thrown and shit like that. Whereas, mm -hmm. no, Kerr, we're the dream team. We don't get fucking thrown. We're the, we're the, so we went out there. I'm suplexing the shit out of these guys. I'm dominating these two guys. And then I tag Kerr in, and he goes out there, and he lets them suplex them like two or three times. And I'm screaming at him in the corner, what are you doing? Let's go. And then he would, he dove out of the arena to tag me, to give me a tap. And I jumped in, and I just, no, man. So he he kind of. He kind of lost a lot of stock right there, and uh, they they couldn't believe how good I did. Because then my next match was the that was the my first match. Then I guess the next match was against Yuji Nagata in um, New Japan main event thirty thousand. All right, Mike Bernardo and uh, Tom Erickson. I shouldn't say that. Mike Bernardo, Tom Erickson, Gary Goodrich. There was like something weird going on between the three of them. Yeah. Was Mike Bernardo supposed to do a fixed fight against Tom Erickson and he kind of pulled the trigger on it, decided not to? I I don't I I don't I could get the details from this, but I know they were buddies as all. I don't I don't did they fight each other? It did like a K one bout, and it was just real strange. Like when I brought it up to Tom in our interview yeah, with Eric, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, re I remember it being a little strange, but I think Bernardo won, right? Yeah, Bernardo knocked him out. Yeah, that's that's the way it should have went. So if it was a fix, that's the way it would have went, anyways. Well, I, I I wonder if Bernardo was supposed to lose, you know, and then he decided right. not. I don't know, but they didn't love the big cat, anyways. They didn't. I don't think so. It was rumored that in one of your pride contracts that it was that you two were never supposed to fight each other. Is that true? I never said nothing like that. That's crazy. I'd fight Tom Erickson. Okay. No questions asked. What about Alan Goez? He's 5-1-2. and two. Um, They wouldn't allow you to use knees to the head. What, wait, you know what? I think this was the fight that got knees to the head outlawed. Am I correct? On the ground, uh, it, it might have, but that fight, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that fight because they did to him what they did to me many times. They set him up. That's the only time Pride really wanted Mark Coleman to win because I was their champion and uh, they were going to give me a little push. And uh, they had the big dole banana thing on my ass. And uh, uh, so they, they called uh, him up two weeks before the fight. And, uh, you know, they did, he, he, he's got a, three kids and a baby on the way. He's fucking a mess. And they just offered him enough money that he had to take it, man. He, he, he just, it just wasn't fair. I mean, it wasn't fair. I was too big, too big and too strong. And he, he had no training in man, zero training. So well, you, that, that was nice. So you were two twenty five at the time, the lightest you had been in about 10 years that day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, only time I fought lighter was uh, well, two oh five. Uh, I fought Shogun Hua at two twenty four, but two twenty five is perfect for me. Hmm. Two twenty four is perfect. You can see my fucking, you can see all my shit. You had uh Jeremy Horn in your corner. Uh, what was it like training with him over at Militich? Oh, he was special, man. He was the one guy. I mean, ninety nine percent of the guys, if I put a neck crank on you. I'd say 98% of the guys I was able to tap rather quickly. And Jeremy Horn just laughed about it, man. I just put it on him. He just, he's Gumby. His neck can squeak, choke. It could go forever. You know what I mean? But uh, he was special, man. He, he, he just was, he just such a good guy, man. Nice guy. Want to help out. Just, just, he just loves helping people. And I, I liked him. It was neat. From there, September 24, 2001, Pride 16, Minotauro Noguera. Uh, nasty fight. Yeah. Well, here's what happened. I think uh, I, I backed out of fighting at once and uh, because I wasn't ready. Well, I, 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 I did blow my knee out, but, I mean, I I had to back out. But then um, then um, that was 9-11. 
right? That was right after 9-11. It like was, September 24th. After. Yeah. And I was at home praying that we couldn't go to Japan because of 9-11. I was going to use it to help me because I just absolutely was just had a bad, hey, let's just be honest. I was, I couldn't get off the booze quick enough. You know what I mean? So I went into that fight, had Josh Barnett in my corner and, um, uh, uh, Josh Barnett don't fuck around. I went in there and basically it was the same as the Couture fight. I was just a pussy, man. I just, I, I didn't do anything. And, 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 and I came out of the ring and Josh Barnett said, fuck you, Coleman. Don't you ever put me in your corner if you're not even going to try to fight i felt like uh yeah i i felt it it was the real deal and he was right i was just in there for the paycheck you had a lot of problems at home i mean not only was 9-11 i think your mother-in-law at the time had cancer like you had a lot going on at that point yeah well there ain't no excuse no excuses there's none no, I, you know, I know uh, you're not an excuse maker, but let me let me just double check here. So, you know, you you talked earlier in this interview about the triangle, uh, don't work on you, that sort of thing. You you've never really had a huge respect for jujitsu. Is now Nogueira was a different guy because he's your size and stuff like that. Did you start to feel a little different about jujitsu with this fight? No, I always had respect for it, but not just too much respect, man. I mean. I'm a wrestler. I had to promote wrestling from day fucking one. You had Hoist Gracie promoting jiu-jitsu. Somebody's got to stand up for wrestling. I'm just saying I respect it at the at the ultimate top level and if it's done properly, but the jiu-jitsu, the jiu-jitsu I see in classes are dudes fucking hugging each other. They're not going after like Gordon Ryan. And I, 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 I maybe sound like I don't respect it, but trust me, I've been submitted three fucking times I very, very much respect it, but I would still be a savage, badass fucking wrestler than a savage, badass jiu-jitsu guy. I'll put my money on myself. Well, Wes Sims at this point said that, and he was in your corner as well, that Hammerhouse has never been su- submitted by jiu-jitsu. They've <laughs> only, they have only lost to illegal wrestling moves. <laughs> well that's silly I don't stand by that statement okay yeah everything was perfectly legal hey what, I was just, that wrestling? And, 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 and against Fedor and against Nogueira um, I, I, I was heading past my prime and, and I had been drinking for years I wasn't the prime Mark Coleman so if I was the prime Mark Coleman I think I I know I beat Nogueira but he, but he's the slickest. He can catch me in that that shit any at any time. But if he, if I'm on my game, he ain't gonna catch me in it. What he caught me in, I know how to defend. I was just too fucking slow. I was just too slow. And then Fedor, ah, eh, you know, fuck. He was I, I. He was pretty goddamn slick. But when I went, when he got me in the armbar the second time, I couldn't believe it because I I was. I, I was thought I was defending it perfectly. And then I found I Frank Trigg broke it down on breaking down the fights. I didn't know what he did to create some space to get his leg over my arm. I had he, he actually reached down through in between our legs and he pushed my leg back to create like a fucking inch. And he whipped his leg over me and got me this second time. So no man, I got respect for it, but there's a counter to everything. And if you're on your fucking game, you're gonna counter that shit, and you're gonna smash them in the eyeballs. There ain't no counter to the smashing in the eyeballs. All right. So, Mark, I watched the New Era fight. Was he greased up? In your opinion, was he a little slippery? Who cares? He, it didn't matter. I like that. I like that. Yeah. It didn't matter. Um, with the. Uh, I, there was a rumor that Kevin Randleman was given the Tito Ortiz fight for a title fight, and he got so excited that he punched a wall and broke his hand, and he had to turn the fight down. Is that true? Um, I can't I can't confirm it one hundred percent. I've heard it too, but I, I can't confirm it. I, I don't know for sure. So it's a story, but for some reason the fight did. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know they ever matched that up. 
<laughs> Did they have that matched up? I, I don't know. I, just, I read it online. Like when I when I researched, that would have been a real neat of... fight, boy. I tell you that. That'd have been a real neat fight. Yeah. Oh yeah. Tito, I I was over in England with Tito about probably let's say a year ago, and uh, he's got the beer in him. I'm not drinking. He's sitting there, and all of a sudden it comes about. Uh, that son of a bitch. They're, they're, Hey, he, there's no way, way in hell he thinks I could beat him, but he, he just said he would have took me down. He would have took me down. I said, Tito, how in the fuck? You're a very average college wrestler level. I said I said this to him. We got Randy Couture standing there. Some About three or four big shots standing there. They're down in the lobby. Carl's Condit. Uh, I said, Tito. I, I said, fucking Kevin Randleman, two-time national champion, never took me down one time in his life. Uh, I can say that about many people. But we'll just use him, for example. He would have smoked you fucking 15 to nothing, brother. Uh, how in the fuck are you going to take me down if he couldn't do it and many others couldn't do it? You know, oh, well, oh, well, well. He... I don't know if he ever admitted to it, but I think he knew. He didn't. He didn't fight. He didn't argue back too much because he had nothing to say. Well, in let's put that statement into proper context. Kevin Randleman took the national title two years and then left his senior year. He probably would have been a three-time national champion. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sickening. And a one-time runner-up. And one time better up. Right. Oh, one of the one of the best ever, but he never never got me. Uh, you know, yeah. so Tito, how the fuck are you gonna take me down? Josh Barnett, I wrestled him many times, and he tried so hard. He never got me. That's so that's so cool because he tried so hard. Uh and then um Rico Rodriguez, he never got me. I can the list goes on and on. Uh, Kurt Angle. Kurt well, Angle got me. He got you? Well, yeah, not not yeah, very many it. times, but he got me counted for the uh Olympic the big one. I was, I was he was my training partner when I was the ninety and ninety one, I was the world team member. He was like ranked third in, in in America. He would come and I would go with him two or three times a day sometimes. No, he never never beat me in those matches, but he beat me when it counted live, like two, three years later, after I had after night two Olympics, dude, I just went hard partying for three years. And I came out of retirement in 95. The year he won the Olympics, I didn't come out of retirement. Fosca just said, hey, you either fucking wrestle, we ain't going to send you a check. So I hopped on a plane and flew out to Arizona. Kurt Angle was in the he was in the tournament. Sure enough, I seen him and I I I only beat him two nothing, but it was a it was a manhandling. It was a man versus a boy. And then, and then I went back to Columbus and I couldn't stay focused. I could have just shifted right into gear and I probably would have made the world team in 95 and maybe probably won it. I, I missed out on the best years of my life, 90, 93, 94, 95, uh, and 96, even when I was in the UFC, that's, that's when I was by far in my prime, but, uh, Angle shows up six months later at the World Trials. When I fought him six months earlier, he weighed about 215 pounds at the most, and I was 225, but I had to weigh in at 220, but he could only get up to 215. Six months later, Kurt Angle shows up at the Olympic, at the World Trials weighing 225 pounds. He had gained 10 pounds in a, in a fucking six months. He could never get over 215 in his life. So... Not saying anything, but he somehow he got very huge and he didn't give up a he didn't give up a point in the whole tournament. He beat Kerr in the finals. First time he beat Kerr. Kerr had beat him the last two years. When I left, Kerr took over. And then uh Angle beat him, beat him in the two out of three to become the world team member. And then he went on and won the world. And then he came back and won the Olympics. But uh he got huge. Oh, yeah, very there was a rumor that he was going to cross over to mixed martial arts and they were eyeing a fight between both you and Kurt Angle. 
Oh, that would have been epic, man. That would have been epic, and it would have been scary. Most the main reason it would have been scary is because uh, he was the cardio machine. He he beat four guys at the Olympics because he was the aggressor. I mean, zero zero score. The ref had to give the decision to somebody. Kurt Angle was a pit bull, man. When he's on you. He don't stop moving. I I got to get my hands on him because I'm big. I'm stronger, the bigger, stronger guy. But man, that dude is so quick, so quick that I I would have to get my hands on him, and uh, it would have been a, it had been a tough one. But I got a feeling, uh, no man, punches, punches and headbutts change the game. Period. Okay, so no one called you offering to do a fake fight with with Kurt Angle. No, I'd have done that for sure. <laughs> what, what do you think of what do you think of Kurt's potential in, in MMA? Because I, I know oh, for, no, for he would have been the only guy who would have beat him was me for a while. Okay. He would have been the man. No doubt about it. In 205, he'd have been the man. He's gonna throw you around like Khabib, dude. Yeah. He's wow. a team. Kurt Angle is Khabib. Only he, and, and let's hope he could get his punching going. But even if he couldn't get his punching up to level with like a Khabib, he's going to get you down and he's going to ground and pound you. And he's going to learn the submission. He's going to be so slick and quick. Mark Schultz, how fast did he get his black belt? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, when we interviewed Pedro Sauer, in essence, he said, within three months, Mark was submitting black belts, but we made him wait 10 years to get it. Yeah. Well, that don't surprise me. Yeah. Schultz, he's a stud, man. He was the man. Everybody feared him. Everybody feared him. I would watch him. When we were at practice, I would watch him. He'd be over all by himself, just walking around with a fucking, just a stoic face. Just fucking not happy, fucking miserable wrestler. <laughs> I just loved it. I wanted to be like, I wanted to be him, man. But uh, he, he he just, I just watched Dave Schultz versus, uh, the other day I called it Dave Schultz versus the German in the Olympic finals, man. I, I didn't know how, Dave Schultz was even better than I thought he was. We talked about it, who's better, Dave or Mark? I don't know, brother. Uh, we said Mark, but. I'm thinking fucking as close as it gets, man. Show yeah. So we, like when we interview, when we do re tons of research, obviously, and when Mark and I had an offline conversation, Mark Coleman and I, my belief is that, that uh, Mark Schultz was probably this much better than his brother, but it's like a yin and a yang. They're both just unstoppable forces, man. No, it's not. The match I just watched, I didn't remember him. I didn't remember him being that good. Hey, he could, he gave me the worst ass whoop of my life. Uh, Dave, Dave Schultz did? did. Dave Schultz did in Russia. He just, uh, I was a, so much bigger, so much stronger. I probably scored more points than he did, but he he scored on me more than any one person did in in a, in a day in my life. He tell, he scored on me like he was he had a fucking smile on his face it was unbelievable we're freezing <laughs> we're in russia it's fucking 30 it's 40 degrees at the most in the room of wrestling and we can see our breath me and dave schultz i'm a kid i'm just fresh out of college uh and that son of a bitch he i could he just used my strength against me it was amazing the the greatest technician ever him and john smith what about Mark Schultz? Did you guys ever wrestle? Yeah, one time. One, one time, uh, he's on the uh, '88 Olympic team, and I'm at the I'm at the camp. I, I'm one year out of I graduated in '87, so one year out of college, and they brought me in because I had the horsepower, man. I had the horsepower to go with these guys, and uh, they said Schultz, and I'm like, oh fuck! I was just like son of a bitch, so scared, man, scared of this dude, but uh. I went out there and he beat me four to nothing. And uh, I was very, very happy with that because he's six years older than me and the baddest ever. I kept it to four to nothing. 
give me two more years and I'll smank him. Yeah, Schultz is special. Let's talk about uh, you know what's, somebody. What's amazing, before we leave the Schultz brothers, what's amazing about them, you know, whichever one, they're, they're the cream of the crop. And then they're, Same, they're, 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 they're I would say they're identical. Yeah, wow. but, and then except for their personalities are completely the opposite. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Because you more, said they beat you smiling. I don't think Mike uh, Mark ever smiled in a competition. No. <laughs> no, man, he's a changed man. He's found some peace in his older age. Thank God. The, the thing with Dave Schultz, I look at him like, let's just pretend they're magicians. Dave Schultz is going to tell you how he pulled the rabbit out of the hat. He's going to show you all of his magic tricks. Mark Schultz, Mark Schultz is going to the grave with all that. He's not teaching you how to beat him. He's not conversating to be friends with you. He's there for one reason, one reason only, and that's to get his hand raised. Yeah, that's me. That's why I loved him. That's who I wanted to be. Like, But, no. Uh, yeah, there, there's a couple of times in practice where I'm taking this, I'm schooling this kid, a buddy of mine. He's in on a high crotch. He's in on a high crotch a thousand times. That's my go-to. Don't grab my leg. You don't plan on getting fucked up, but we're fighting it. We're fighting it. And, and all of a sudden he looks up at me and says, well, what am I doing wrong? And I said, it's way too hard to explain right now. We got to get a workout in, bro. Let's go. <laughs> but it, it and then the answer was, you're not doing nothing wrong. You're doing it right, but I'm just fucking better. It's that simple. Let's go. Keep going. <laughs> it's not your fault. It's not his fault. It's not his fault. You're just better. That's it. <laughs> Let's talk Can't about it. Well, see, strength, strength equalizes all these fucking techniques, brother. That's what it, that's what I'm saying. When it came to me and John McCarthy, my strength is the only fucking reason I was able to get out. Too strong. And he's a strong fucker. Big John Strong. Let's talk about somebody that recently made the news. Phil Baroni, obviously a uh, training partner and friend of yours at one point. Um, have you had any communication with Phil? Have I talked to him? Yeah, since, no, since he got let go. No, that's it, it, it's it's really confusing. Um, you know, people tell me I should pick my friends better. You know, he was a teammate and a and a business partner, and yes, we I I, I did care about this guy, but he's not the guy that I ran around with. You know, what I mean, I had to meet him at the fights and get him through the fights, and I do care about the guy, but um, uh, well, how'd you guys meet? How'd you guys meet? Uh, just I'm, I'm out in Vegas training for the Crow Cow fight, and he just got suspended from the UFC. He's in the gym, Mark Lehman's gym, and uh, uh, I'm in there training, and he's sitting in the corner. I went up to him, I said, Well, what are you doing, Brony? And I didn't even know him. I said, He's like, Fuck, man, you know, life sucks, fuck, man, suspended, I'm fucked, I'm ruined. I just simply said, Well, what the fuck, dude, there's going to be another fight. You don't need to be sitting over here. Get your ass going. And uh, it, it, he was smart enough. He, he's like, uh, I got to fight Crow Cop in three weeks in Japan, and he he don't have a job. So he's like, hey, man, you, you think I can come over and corner you? I said, well, yeah, you can come over. I'm not paying for nothing. I mean, it's on you. He's like, I'll pay for it. I just, you know, he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to go over there and get noticed. And he wanted me to me to get him a fight. And uh, so he came over there and did it. And I lost the crook up. But at 5 a.m., I'm sitting there talking with Saki Bar. And I said, here. I said, look at this guy here. And Saki Bar likes good-looking men. He likes good-looking men. And uh, I said, I, this guy, I said, he's had it rough the last couple goals there in the UFC. But he'll look like this. And, uh. And Sakibara said, I'll give you an offer on Monday, Coleman. And uh, that's when the interpreter horse mouth told him to shut up. 
because you're not supposed to show excitement in negotiation. He was excited. And uh, that's it. I went over there. <laughs> I helped him with the camp. By far the most craziest camp I've ever been involved with, just with a, with a man. He just had really lots of anger. Just lots and lots of anger, but uh, I had anger too. So it you know, kind of was normal, but I wasn't used to somebody being a lot more angry than me. But uh, um, and he had the epic fight with Minowa, and uh, they called us the Muscle Brothers. Me, Peroni, and Randman, we were called the Muscle Brothers. It had to, the entrance was the top entrance of the of the year there in Japan, but. Uh, you know, we did, you, you, you're kind of going to bond. I tried to help him out. You know, I wanted to help the guy out. He didn't, he didn't like anybody. He didn't like me either, really, probably. Just used me, probably, but I know he liked me. And uh, just horrible. About the, honestly, about the most horrible thing I could ever hear in my life. Um, just, just, just the, just the rock bottom. And it, it it's really, really, I'm trying to keep it out of my head as best I can, but uh, it's causing me nightmares. I mean, it's causing me a lot of nightmares lately. I mean, it, 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 could I, be you. Had, had uh, you kept drinking and dry, drinking no, and drinking? No, I thank the Lord that I have anger and rage, but I never, I never even been in, I never even beat men that I could have beat, dude. I ain't ever touching a fucking woman. You know, that's that that's not even an option. I don't care how drunk I was. That's not an option. I didn't even hit men. When I was drunk, you know, thank the Lord that I, thank the Lord that I don't have that problem. I think, um, uh, I think, yes, he should be in a mental hospital. I mean, but it's too late. It's too late. Once you do something like this, it's, it's just almost too late. I'm, I'm hearing horrible shit over there, man. I'm hearing horrible shit and it, it, it it's, I'm, I'm confused. You know what I mean? Cause, uh, the Lord don't want me judging, but it, I'm just not Lord, surprised. Yeah, you're not surprised. Yeah, let me, no, let me ask you one more about man. that. Wow. Well, I just wanted to mention, you know, the Hammer House is a team that has some of the most loyal life, like, you know, they, they say Hammer House for life, you know. And they mean that, you know, if that had been Randleman in, in Mexico, you know, rest his soul. And I don't mean to use his name that way, but you'd be down there with him. You, I mean, just going to help. I mean, you know, because yeah, he was I your brother. So. We're, how, we're, how come Baroni didn't flit into the Hammer House like a like that, like the other guys, like Wes, like him, like no, Nutter? No, he was in there like, oh, he was the big five, man. He was one of the big five. He, he was in there as solid as a rock. But... He just, uh, you know, I just, I didn't like things, man. That's all I got to say is I didn't like things, but I don't turn my back on some fucker that needs me, but I didn't like anything. You know, I tried to get him to get some help. I was just More than one occasion. Quite a bit. More than one occasion. I started talking to him again by text a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, and then he's, I know he's just down and out, and I'm, I'm, but he, he just keeps insisting he's strong and he wants to fight, begging me to get him a fight. And, uh, you know, I was I just tell him to get started, man. Get off whatever you're on. Get fucking started. Get it together. And, you know, just uh, it's, 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 it's just as horrible as it gets. Okay, yeah. did you have any... Did you have any insight into what his life was like growing up, like his household? Yeah, I knew all about him. I'm not going to talk about it right now, Mike. Respectfully, I'm not going to talk about okay. it right now. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. I talked too much. I really don't even want to, I didn't even really want to say that, but I did. But no, Here, I mean, it's, let me change he's got to go to trial. And he he got to go to trial and he, he deserves at least a fair trial. But yeah. I don't even know if he'll, I don't know. I don't. I'm not too sure he's going to make it to trial. 
Uh, I I talked to an attorney yesterday, and they said that he he's missing some teeth since he got to jail. And yeah. I figured it was the inmates. And she's like, no, no, it was the officers that did it. They mad at him? Man, whenever you got somebody that's a foreigner coming in and murdering yeah. a local... No, I'm saying he didn't get cocky with them. They just did it out of, for no reason, right? I I don't know. Who yeah, knows? Most likely, because I don't. If he ain't humbled by now, I mean, I'm hoping that Phil Brony's humbled in there. But at the same time, uh, he, he he's going to have to fight. So he can't be too humble because. Uh, <laughs> He deserves a day in court, and and, and, and whatever happens to him, it, it, you know, that's what he deserves. But right. he, he, you know, he, I, he deserves a fair trial. That's going to have everybody should agree on that. Yeah. Uh, he deserves a fair trial. So, what about Crazy Horse? Did you ever deal with him in Pride backstage? Yeah, yeah, we were good buddies. I loved him, man. He was something else. He was he was just something else, man. He was funny as hell. Yeah, he told me a bunch of stories. And uh, whenever anybody tells me a story, I fucking poke the hell out of them like a detective and I make sure they ain't fucking lying. I mean, I don't need no lies. So he had some good stories. And then, of course, I never, I'm not, I, I have seen him since the uh, Silva attack, but that, that, that one like Silva attack, that's more impressive than you could ever. I mean, Mike, what he did to Silva is fucking balls, man. That's that. I love that. Can you walk us through it? I don't know. I wasn't there. Everybody's seen it. Everybody said he knocked out Wanderlei Silva <laughs> after they were uh, harassing him. Yeah. Yeah, he knocked him out. He was supposedly just knocked him out with one big punch. And Silva woke up and. Went back after him. You know what I mean? He went back after him. I don't think he got him the same night, but someday, at some point, Silva got into his locker room, and uh, uh, it was on, and uh, I think he choked uh, – I think he choked – bent it out. I think yeah. he choked the face yours out, but, uh, oh, he stalked him forever. Wonderly was not letting it go. I mean, he stalked him for until he got him. But he – Charles got the best, man. That That's – that's as epic as it gets. Then he, the, the great thing to Silva is he gets up and fights. He fought that night. That's right. That's he right. Fought Dr. Dude out. So I was at a bare knuckle. I think it was in, it was in Tampa Bay. And they had Wanderley Silva, Verdum. They had a whole bunch of these, you know, high end Brazilian guys there. And Charles Bennett was there. And from the ring, but from the audience to the ring, th like they were jawing at each other. Like that—that that is, there's no faking whatever took place between all of them. Yeah, there's no fake, no fake no. at all. It's all hate. Yeah, yeah. So, Mark, we're coming up on two hours, buddy. I know we've got some more pride fights left. We're gonna have to. Why don't we do schedule it another time? Because I know you've got practice and stuff like that. Um. Mark, man, you being sober, it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, we, should announced, we should have announced that earlier. That's the most important thing. Um, I can do anything as long as I stay sober. Yeah, and I, I want to give Mark a particular shout out too, because, you know, we're a history podcast, and here he, he came in sober and he told us, you know, under the hood what went on. Um, and uh, he's been asked that question his whole entire career. And he's always uh, really been pretty honorable about, you know, no commenting and not wanting to really tell the story and stuff. And he never lied about it or anything like that. And he held up his end of the bargain with the Pride people for many, many years. And I thank him very much for, you know, giving us the opportunity to, to be his voice and, and, to, and to, you know, for history, maybe, you know, putting down what really happened. It's important. So thank you, Mark. Yes, sir. You guys are awesome, man. Keep keep plugging away. You're the best. You're the best. Hey. I mean, you guys, uh, you do your homework, and I appreciate that. Hey, Thank Rico Chiaparelli. My buddy. How come you didn't weren't a part of Raw team? Because I'm Hammer House. They, they was my main rival. <laughs> they were my rival, man. I want to take them out. 
Rico mm-hmm. wasn't part of Raw. I thought Chiaparelli started Raw. Oh, Rico Chiaparelli. I said you. I thought you said Rico Rodriguez. No, Rico Chiaparelli. Yeah, just uh, we we go way back. We roomed together a couple of times in the wrestling shit, but uh, um, no, they started Raw. I started Hammer House. It was like me versus them trying to. We we both we try to round up the big boys, man. Round them up and go whoop some ass. That's I, good. I'm surprised Erickson didn't didn't he was very well offered to come on Hammer House, but he went with Raw. They probably they probably gave him a better business plan than I did. I said, let's go whoop some fucking ass and make some money, and they probably broke it down to him. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Mark. Be good, buddy. All right, love you guys. Take care, man. Right. Miguel Durante, I think we can say that right there. That right there might be candidate for interview of the year. It's 2023. We're still in January. Mark Coleman came out hot. Yeah, you know, uh, I mentioned it as we were t- tailing off. I don't, you know, I want to pause and, and labor the point a little bit that that the Kata fight has always been something that fans, you know, thought was a work. And, and Mark's been asked about it a lot throughout his career, a lot. And I've asked him about it. And, you know, he's never come out and said what happened until today. Um, so, you know, it's wait, kind wait, of wait. That, that, what was the standard response that you were told? Because I know the one I was told. Yeah. He, like I said, I asked him, you know, in, in like an interview context. And then I've asked him in private where we were hanging out. And then, even then, he would say, it, it is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> and that's as far as you got with him, you know. So, Wes Sims and I, we're like two women at a coffee shop. We, we literally, we talk all day. Mostly to, you know, bust chops and, and yell at each other. But even he had told me, bro, don't even ask about it. Mark's going to tell you the same thing he told me. It is what it is. We all know it was the work. Do I think he got paid? I hope so. But he's only going to tell you it is what it is. There's a code there. Mark's not going to break it. Now, normally, like, when we go at these interviews, Miguel, a lot of, oftentimes, we kind of go at them like a police interview. Like, we know when there's, like, a hot button right there, and you can't start with that hot button. you got to get them comfortable. In this instance, I don't think it was necessary. I think it was a respect thing. Mark listens to our podcast. You can oftentimes see him commenting um, underneath our interviews. But I think more than anything, it's it's just a level of respect that he he gives us, which, man, is very difficult to get from that man. But we always start with something a little bit hot. And that John Jones, like, that's a story I've been sitting on for a while, and I didn't want to tell it under until we had it under its proper context. So Coleman kind of a uh, big time in John Jones. <laughs> Is that yeah, fantastic? Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, when, once you start getting to the elite of the elite, you get into guys, you get, and my, you know, it's a common theme in Mark's interviews because he's open with us. And he, he, that's about as honest as you're going to get him. But it's a constant theme of no one took me down. It's that type A personality that, they don't want to lose any grappling no. session, any training session, any scrabble game. You know, they don't want to lose ever. They don't want to come in second in anything. And, you know, I think that touches on the Matt Hughes point that you brought up too. Matt is, you know, little by body, but that feeling is every bit like Mark's where, you know, if you're a type A personality, I think that's where it shows. And when they clash or, or run into each other, the, you know, it can often be very interesting. Well, let's let's look at the Matt Hughes, Mark Coleman situation, like at a whole. Mark Coleman, like at one point in his life, if Mark Coleman didn't know your name and where you were from, you couldn't beat him up. That's a fact. The entire world falls into that. That's a fact. For like uh, him to say, Anybody to say that Mark Coleman is scared, no, no, no. He might be cautious. He might kind of want to wait for the situation to be a little bit in a better light. But to say he's scared, 
that, that's that's a really bold statement to make. Now, <laughs> a drunk Mark Coleman, like he said, is even less afraid than a sober Mark Coleman. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> and, you know, and he said I, he was I, drunk I, while cornering Wes. <laughs> he said he was drunk 98% of the time he cornered. <laughs> So yeah, a little bit of the chaos there, but he delivered. He delivered in his return interview here a little bit of history, you know, with with the honesty and and you know showing his sober side too. Uh, you know, clearly uh, he's having fun with life. It looks like you know, and that's that's a nice thing to see because a lot of people struggle in sobriety. You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, hopefully he's having a blast. Continuing. Yeah, he's having a good time. So hopefully yeah, that he is. As well. He is. Um... Yeah, the Tagata, man, he called Matt Hughes a turd, which I, I called people after this going, dude, Coleman said this about Matt Hughes. First and foremost, Mark Coleman said that, not me, Mike Davis. I laugh at it because, dude, Mark, Matt Hughes, even in his current state, could twist my head off. And he's also one of my favorite fighters, truth be told. I loved me a Matt Hughes fight, dude. He's one of my favorite guys. Uh, the Underground Forum. Miguel Durante, those guys have been very kind. The board has come along. I'm glad I got their shout out in. Crowbar, MMA purist, Rambo John Jay. Dude, this guy Rambo John Jay created a uh, he created a Reddit account and deals with all of the politics over there and all the pronouns that that he that they that they you know pretty much make you use. And um, he's got us a bunch of followers, bro. That guy's really, he's an or he's from Oregon. I'm not going to say his name. I respect. He's got a t-shirt coming this week. I'm sending one out to him this week. Crowbar, you too. Vegan Higgler, send us your address, dude. We got you guys covered as well. DeVry's Town, send us your address. Email, I, I got those in yeah. my email. So. Um, yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, we're, we're changing some things around. We're over at the new, we're at the Lights Out Clips page, at Lights Out Clips on, on YouTube. That's the uh, channel that we're going to go full throttle on. That's where the podcast and the full length material will be. And uh, we'll have the full library up there. Hopefully by the time you see us, if not shortly after. Yeah. We're eventually going to have a paywall as well. All of our interviews are going to be free, all the audio, but we got to try to figure out how to monetize this thing. Miguel, we just got our numbers back from Buzzsprout, which is one of the world's largest podcast hosts in regards to, you know, putting up, putting them, putting your podcast, uploading it to various uh, different avenues. And we're in the top 25% of all of the podcasts that are hosted by Buzzsprout. And the majority of it, the, of our, our, our downloads were within the last quarter of last year. So if we can maintain without losing a single person, we're in that top 20% now. But that hill to climb to get up there is incredibly steep. So the only way we can do this, if you guys like, share, subscribe, you guys, please make some Reddit accounts. I am Mike. I, I can't deal with that headache, so I, I don't go there. But if you guys can help spread the podcast, it's great. Now, Phil Baroni. I know it's a hard subject. You, you, Miguel, here's the thing about Phil Baroni, and, and this is a hard truth that people, they're not going to publicly disagree with me, but they also won't agree with me. Lots of people care about Phil Baroni. Very few of them actually like Phil Baroni. He's just got one of those personalities that um, is very divisive. And um, his home life is, there, there might be a movie made about him one day. Um, Miguel, how many countless boxers from the turn of the century died in prison or in mental institutions? Um, it's just, it's part of the sport. It's just, it's just what happens. It's a super sad story. The area where he's being held, they might ship him to a jail once he's convicted to Las Islas Marias. It's an actually like an Alcatraz type Island, um, right outside Puerto Vallarta. That's actually in Nayarit, the following state, Miguel. They used to like in the early 2000s, like nineties and two thousands, they would ship families there. Like if some guy was like a total jerk, they would send his whole family there. I go, no, no, no. You guys all live there. I met a kid. He was about 21 years old who, who grew up there because his dad got locked up. Dude, 
I, I, it was the first time I've ever seen somebody that's completely institutionalized. I think I was like 23 years old when I met the person, you know, eating with his arm in front and just shoveling food in his mouth and worried about people taking it. Dude, it's like, it's like Lord of the Flies on that island. From what I understand, it's a little different now, but where that guy's about to go, man, I don't wish that on anybody. Yeah, he didn't have the tools to do anything but one thing, really, and, and that always doesn't go well in those settings. You know, you don't want to be, you know, reliant on fist fighting your your, your way through a, a long sentence or for the rest of your life there. Who knows what he's going to do? He has yeah, said, I think, you know, my hat's off to Mark. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it, I think it shows Mark's character um, in that uh, he didn't write Phil off in terms of he said, no, he was, he didn't say, he said, no, he was one of the Hammer House Five. And I'm assuming that's Hinkle, Sims, Randleman, Coleman, and Baroni. Well, there's also other people. Like they, they've had Hammer House, like had a war machine that a brief. But he brief said step Hammer House five, so I think that there is a big five in there in yeah. the way of thinking. Yeah, like no, yeah. it would be is a guy who's still you know is Hammer House for life, but I guess he didn't make that five uh, unless I'm wrong about somebody, but. You know, it's obviously Coleman, Randleman, Sims, you know, the, you know, if Baroni's one of those, who's the other guy? Hinkle, probably. Hinkle, Abby Hinkle. Uh, he's got 50 fights, <laughs> you know. So, it's got to be Hank, yeah. yeah. So, um, my hat's off to Coleman. Thank you very much. Enjoy the Yeah, what a class act, huh? We'll see. What a class act. Oh, yeah, well, very classy. <laughs> so, let, let's keep this in mind. Out, I love it. All right, so let, let me just kind of break it down. Our first Mark Coleman interview that we released was his road to the UFC belt, where he was screaming at the top of his lungs about John McCarthy because he got set up. The second interview that we dropped, we were short on, I think we were short on releases, and it's actually something we were testing our equipment out, and it was just to kind of, you know, just kind of dip our foot in the water with Mark Coleman. We did a before the UFC interview there. The first 10 minutes, the audio is kind of shoddy. I wish, you know, Miguel, maybe we could clean that up. Um, but phenomenal stories afterward. This is Pride. He's got 10 more fights. And I can tell you another thing. We never really delved, heavily delved into his relationship with Mark Kerr, which they were as thick as thieves at this time. Um, another thing that we're probably going to do with mark coleman in the future is uh mark schultz wants to come on and they want to talk about olympic wrestling and traveling to russia together so we can go through all of their their bouts what took place over there we've got a few more things planned for mark coleman it's just getting him to commit he's not an easy guy to track down he doesn't but, do many interviews but mark coleman the pride years is in the books Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.